Heavenly Father, Lord, wow, what blessings. Oh, Lord, that you have brought new people, new faces, faces we haven't seen in a long time. New faces and old faces, and then those we just cherish so much, Lord, you have truly blessed our time. And I'm grateful for the gathering. Lord, we've talked about people deployed. We've talked about people going through hard stuff. This is the day in which we live in, Lord, and you have left, you have lifted at us. You've lifted us into a place where we can fellowship together. We can talk about God's word. We can fellowship. We can pull each other up by the bootstraps, Lord. It's so important in these days. Father, I pray, Lord, that this message would go out and it would find its mark, Lord, that it would bury itself like seeds deep in our hearts and that it, they would culminate and bear fruit. Father, turn up that hallowed ground and, and soften our hearts and open our ears to the things we need to hear, Lord. I pray the Spirit would rest upon us here, that you would indwell each and every one of us as we go forward. Father, I, I, I ask, Lord, that you would allow me to, to, to be pastor teacher today and that what you say are your words only. Bless us and keep us. Go before us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we have been going through Romans. We started that. <clears throat> Today's Bible study is called, Seriously, No One is Good. Seriously, No One is Good. We have now gone through Romans. Two, the first two chapters of Romans, we have done six studies through two chapters. We have gone through all kinds of things because Paul is writing a, a legal briefing here. And we're trying to find out how we're going, why is it the gospel is so important? Paul knew because he's writing this letter to the Romans. He knew that there was division in the church. After a time, the Jews had been kicked out of Rome. And so the Christians had taken over, the Gentile Christians had taken over the church. Well, after a few years in the death of the Caesar that was running Rome, he, they, they allowed the Jews to come back in. So the Jews and the Gentiles now are bashing at each other in the church. Paul, wanting to meet them, is writing a letter to get there first so that maybe he can get some housekeeping situations taken care of. This is maybe one of the best legal um, briefings that we see in the Bible to talk about why the gospel is important, why Jesus is important, why we need a savior, why what God is going to do with the Jewish people, where's the rapture going to happen, all this stuff talked about in a tight and concise book. But after six studies, we have talked about all the wickedness and all the evilness and everything that the world is showing even right now. But in chapter 3, things are going to change. And although we won't get to the U-turn today, we won't get down there. We will finish up as if this is a, a, a final um, plea by Paul to see why if you need a Savior. Why is Jesus so important? We learned in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We learned in this verse, this first verse in chapter 1, where it starts to talk about the real nuts and bolts of what's going on, he says that God already has it figured out. He's already going to judge wickedness. It's already written in heaven. And we're waiting for the only answer you have to escape it, which is the Savior. Now, Paul hasn't covered that yet because he needs to build upon, just like you would an investigation, to build upon what's important about why you need a Savior. See, that leads me to a question. If I wanted you to know that the gospel was important, what would I need to tell you? That is to say, if I wanted to come and sell you the gospel, sell you Jesus Christ, what, why would, what would you need to know about that, right? And my, my question is, is it why? Why do I need to know? Why do I need the gospel? I'm a good person. I'm not Adolf Hitler. I, I live my life. I'm doing good things. I go to church. I got baptized when I was a kid. I'm doing all the things I need to do. Why on earth do I need to admit that I'm a sinner and that I need to be saved? That's what's going to happen here. That's what he's going to do through this book. 
It's much like a, liter a literature review. And as I'm going through schooling, I'm reading a ridiculous number of research papers. Well, the way that it works in academia is, is that if you have a problem you want to research, you need to decide what that is. But you have to, you have to talk people into understanding why it's even an issue. Why is it even a problem that you want to look at? So in writing a paper or doing a research project, I have to go and culminate all the information that has been written up until this point. Anything that's developed the problem up into this place where people can say, all right, I see that what you're going to do is good enough to add to the body of language. That's what we want to do here. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what Paul's going to do here. Instead of just coming out and saying, hey, you need Jesus, because that's what everybody does in the gospel, he's going to intricately build this case. And that's what he's been doing since Romans chapter 1, verse 18. See, all of he's been talking about so far is sin and wickedness. And from Romans chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 3, verse 21, he's going to cover all kinds of different issues. We've already talked about people who don't have a belief at all. People who have suppressed the truth and unrighteousness to deny that the evidence of God is not even there, that God's not even real. We've talked about false religions. People who said, I don't care about God. I'm going to make up my own God. I'm going to use my own thinking and make up my own idols. And I'm going to come up with my own. I'm going to worship all kinds of other things, but it's not going to be the God of the Bible. We talked about skewed priorities. We've talked about people who knew God or believed it. They didn't go about it in the right way. Instead, those people have made it all about works and not about faith. Those people that say, well, because I'm baptized, I'm saved. Because I'm circumcised, I'm saved. Because I'm a Jew and I was born a Jew, I'm saved. Well, this is the wrong priority. This is not where, and then of course we talked last time about hypocrisy. Those people who said, you know what, I am a Jew and I have all the evidence and I have all the education. And therefore, I can tell you what to do. I don't have to worry about it. I'm impervious to sin. And that's a problem because the religious rulers were railed on against Je Jesus, railed on them for that, that same very, very same problem. So what we find in chapter three, at least in the first half of chapter three, is a summation of people. He's going to come together and say, we've talked about all these problems, all these people who don't believe in Jesus, all these people who don't believe in God, all these people who are pushing sinful behaviors because that's what they want to do. Not seeing that back in chapter one, verse 18, God has already ordained punishment for those who are sinful and unrighteous in that way. Now I'm in the New Living Translation and I told you that because Paul, they're just a, there's just a different attitude written in this way, the way Paul is writing this. And so let's pick up in Romans. I'm going to pick up in Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29 to get a, a running head start. Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. It says, <clears throat> For you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by the Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. We need to set the stage. Who are we talking about here? Paul says, just because you're, you were born a Jew doesn't mean anything. Just because you were, you did the... You did the snip of circumcision doesn't mean you're, it doesn't mean anything if your heart's not in it. And I was thinking about it today and I, and I, and I kind of took that as a football analogy. I'm not on the team, but I, I resort with the team. I, I'm a fan of the team. Mm -hmm. For a long time, I was associated with my love for the New Orleans Saints. They were my team and I wore shirts and I wore sweatshirts and I, they were my team. I didn't play for them. I wasn't on the team, 
but I associated with them. My heart was with them. Now, I can't say that I'm a football player. I'm not. <laughs> but I sure, do, I sure did love them. And I sure did worship them for a time. It was an idol in my life. Now, that's passed on because God has done other things. But it's the same kind of idea. These religious rulers and these Jews thought that because they were Jews, they were saved. And they were impervious to sin. And then they only had to follow the law. And then if you were special enough to be a rabbi, you got to enforce it, but not follow it. And we talked about that in chapter 2. But we're going to go in. Paul, this is... This is Paul's frequently asked questions, the FAQs portion of this book. He is going to ask questions. I Personally, I believe that he's, he's waiting to answer. He, he's going to have to face the answers if he shows up in person. He's trying to head them off because these are, these are questions he thinks the Jewish side of this, of this problem is going to ask. Is going to ask. So he's looking to answer those questions before he gets there. We see the same mentality in the Corinthian, in his letters to Corinth. In 2 Corinthians, he says, look, you guys have got some problems in your church. Before I get there, please work it out so I don't have to come and bring church discipline. I want it done by the time I get there. He's doing the same thing here. Take, take heed of what I say. Fix the division in the church because we're all supposed to be single-minded and one-hearted chasing after Jesus. And then when I get there, everything will be good. Because I don't deny. I, I, I'm not going to dabble in this unless I have to. I like that. I like that attitude. So he needs to, re, he needs to reduce division. So with that, all of that, let's look at chapter 3, verse 1. Now, it's important to understand, he says, as we get into verse 1 in chapter 3, he says, look, just because you're a Jew doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything special. You have to have a heart to be a Jew. You have to have a heart that goes along with circumcision because it's not it's not a physical thing. It's an emotional, spiritual thing. And that's what he says, because in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, well, then what's the advantage of being a Jew? He, he said, okay, what questions do you think they're going to ask me? Uh, well, if, if being a Jew is not special, then what's the point? He says, what's the point of being a Jew? Is there any value in the ceremony of circumcision? Well, yes, there are great benefits. First of all, the Jews are entrusted with the whole revelation of God. The New King James Version will say the oracles of God. Well, he, he immediately says, well, just because you're a Jew doesn't mean you're saved, but God had a plan. He chose you as a people. He set you apart. He gave you circumcision so that you would know yourself as a token to prove you're set apart. And then knowing from your people, the Messiah was going to come. That's pretty special. He said, because you're a Jew, you've been given the word of God. You've been given Jesus Christ. You've been given all this. You guys need to take it to the world. Paul learned that. Peter learned that in Acts when he ends up going down to the centurion's house. But Paul's answer is, of course it's good. You're God's chosen people. By the way, only one nation has a promise that they will never be wiped off the map. That's the Jewish nation. That promise is not in the United States. That promise isn't in Russia. It's not in China or anywhere else. God's people sit in Israel. Now, if you think that, if you're of the belief that the church has taken over the Jewish state and the Jewish state doesn't count anymore, that's called replacement theology. That's a false teaching. You can dispel that in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, when, when Paul very specifically talks about God turning his face back to the Jewish people. So here he is. You say, look, there's absolutely something good about that. But you have to get off your high horse. It's not a physical thing. You have to have the heart of God. You have to be circumcised and set apart. Galatians chapter 5 verse 15 says, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. 
He's back to this divisive thing. Hey, you need to take care of this division because if you're fighting inwards, then the church isn't fighting outwards. And who's winning? Who wins when there's division? Jesus told Jesus told him this. Said, look, if Satan is in the division, if if the house is divided, it can't stand against itself. So he says, you guys have to figure this out. You're both on equal playing fields. We've noticed in chapter 1 and chapter 2 on several occasions already that he says God doesn't play favorites. He doesn't play partiality. Jews and Gentiles are accepted again. We know now that it isn't anything but saved or lost. And we're seeking after to increase the population of the saved. Galatians chapter 6 verse 3 to 6 says, For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Verse 6 says, Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Well, there's the oracles of God that he's talking about here. I've given you the revelation of God. But here he is saying the teachers of the word need to be treated the same as the hearers of the word. If this was not true, then I'd lord over you. I'm the teacher of, I, I'm better than you are because I'm teaching you the word and you're hearing it. But that's not true. Jesus wants me to be the servant of all. We all hear the word and we're all equal at that point. We're all part of the body of Christ and we're all here to edify each other. It doesn't work that way. Jesus said the Gentiles want to lord over each other. That's not how we work. We work by serving each other and being with each other and lifting each other up. He says, don't tear each other up and make sure that you are that you see yourself less than everybody else. See somebody better than as better than you. If you see them better and they see you better, then the humility that comes together is a, is a comfortable relationship. Paul is teaching the right mentality, and we see the definition of the right mentality. This may be the best definition in the Bible of this right mentality. You see it in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 to 4, when he says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out for only for his, not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. This was the heart that Jesus had. He was, he, if you continue in Philippians, he says, Jesus had this mentality. He was God in, and he came down, he gave away all his glory, and he was obedient to the Father, even unto the worst death in history. This is the kind of mentality. He gave everything away so that we could be saved. He saw us so much. He loved us so much. So we see these issues about what Paul is saying here, and we're, take, we're spending some time here because it's the most important part of any of this, is the mentality of a Christian, a mentality of someone who follows Jesus, need to have their priorities and responsibilities in order. It isn't to march around and puff yourself up. It's not to put on special robes and be and be fancy and stand in the corners and pray out loud and make people see how special you are. That's not what we're here to do. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Take it all out as far as you can. Bring the gospel to the world and love people. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you want to keep your fingers here, go ahead and turn to 1 John really quick. If not, I can read them to you. <clears throat> but what are our priorities and our responsibilities as a Christian? Here's just a couple of those. 1 John chapter 2, verse 7 says, Dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it's an old one you've had from the very beginning. This old commandment to love one another is the same message you heard before, yet it's also new. Jesus lived this truth of his commandment, 
and you also are living it. For the darkness is disappearing and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims I am living in the light but hates fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by darkness. What are your priorities and your responsibilities? Loving others, loving other believers, bearing up under their burdens, praying for one another. Those are part of what we're asked to do. Second, first uh, John chapter two, verse 28. And now, dear children, remain in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. Since we know that Christ is righteous, we also know that all who do what is right are God's children. You realize that at the Bema seat, we have a one-on-one -on -one face to face meeting with Jesus Christ. And he's going to act, he's going to have a discussion about your life and what you did for the kingdom. And what is this good and what is this bad and how it's going to work out. Now, it has nothing to do with your salvation, but it does have something to do with the treasures you have heaped up in heaven. Now, I'm not so worried about what it comes out of, but a face-to-face -face meeting, you and Jesus Christ, about your life. Live your life in such a way that you don't cower in shame but that you have courage to stand before Jesus and proclaim that your life was meant for him. No matter when you start, because you can start at any time. That's the heart that Jesus wants us to have. And you have that parable of the, of the guys out in the field where some, are, some were hired at nine in the morning and others were hired at 11 in the afternoon and some were at five o'clock in the afternoon or whatever that is. And Everybody got the same reward, salvation in heaven. But that meeting is coming, and that meeting is going to be at the end of the rapture, whenever that happens. And it's probably fairly safe to say that time is becoming close. Make sure you're fit in, that your priorities and responsibilities are, are, are dialed in. How about 1 John chapter 3, verse 3? And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure, just as he's pure. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law, for all sin is contrary to the law of God. Mm, that's not what I'm looking for. <laughs> hey, but we can talk about that. How about uh, verse 16? We know that real love, 1 John 3, verse 16. We know that real love is, is because Jesus gave us his life for us. So we also ought to give our lives for other brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth, so we will be confident when we stand before God. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings, and he knows everything. We're talking about priorities and responsibilities. Who are we supposed to be? These guys are like, well, what does it mean to be a Jew? Well, then be a Christian and have your heart fixed on God. That's the point of all of this. So Romans, back in Romans chapter 3, verse 3, with that longest introduction of all time. It says, true, some of them are unfaithful. But just because they were unfaithful, does that mean God will be unfaithful? Well, of course not. Even if everyone else is a liar, God is true. As the scriptures say about him, you will be proven right in what you say, and you will win your court case. 
you're, you will win your case in court. And this is really an important point. That statement, he says, you will be proved right is found in Psalm 51. And we know that Psalm 51 is David's repentant uh, psalm, the one that he's repenting of his sins of Uriah, of the death of Uriah, the murder, the conspiracy to commit murder with Uriah, right? And the Bathsheba incident. Where he's, he's coming to God and he's writing this as he is repenting of his sins. And it says... I wanted to read to you verse 3 to verse 5. It has this verse in the middle of it. But this is the kind of heart that Paul that Paul is seeking after these people because if you look in chapter if you're looking in verse 3 and 4 here, these people are saying, "Well, wait a minute. If the people that are that are teaching the Bible are unfaithful, does that mean God's unfaithful?" No. <laughs> God is the truth. If God says something, it's the truth. These people that are teaching it, they're the liars. We need to set our heart correct, and that's where Peter, and that's why Paul brings into this and in, into his uh, speaking. He brings into this psalm. The one thing about Paul, he's really good at quoting the Old Testament. He's really good at bringing in evidence these guys should already know. He's not making stuff up. He's bringing a precedent from the Old Testament. That's great. Psalm 51, verse 3 to 5, and I'm reading it in the New Living Translation. It says, For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. This is a heart of a man who has a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Here's a man who realizes what he's done wrong. Why this is important to me is the second half of verse 4, when it says, you will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. David is making the statement, I realize I'm a sinner. I realize I don't, I don't expect mercy from you. I do realize that whatever judgment that comes against me is right. I can't exp I cannot I cannot argue with what you have to say. I cannot argue with what's coming against me because I did it and I repent of that. This is the heart that God needs us to have. These guys in here Paul is coming against them and saying, "You need to put down your attitude. You need to put down all of that stuff because you're finding yourself in a place that is too prideful and too haughty and too arrogant. If you look at Psalm 51, 17, just down that psalm a little bit, it says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. See, we're getting to this point where Paul is saying, look, you have to understand why the gospel is important. We're getting to the point where you have to admit you're a sinner. You're getting to the point where you have to admit you're spiritually poor and in need of a savior. Mm -hmm. Because the Jews are all kinds of outside this thinking. Because from the Old Testament, they believe that they own, they own the block on salvation and they don't. So this is where he's standing. And he's saying, you guys... God is right, even when you're wrong. Understand where the truth comes from. <laughs> and now I have to laugh because now we're in we're at chat, we're at verse five. I'm going to read to you this paragraph. This is the paragraph by why we're in the New Living Translation. And I want you to listen to what is being said here, and I want you to think about our culture as we live in it right now. Paul says, chapter five, but. Some might say, our sinfulness serves a good purpose, for it helps people see how righteous God is. Isn't it unfair that for him to punish us? Now, wait a minute. <laughs> they're, say, they're saying that I'm sinning. My sinning makes God look better. So why is he punishing me for making him look better? That's what he, that's what he's saying here. Does it sound like the things that are going on today? 
as we tolerate stuff that is clearly anti-Bible, as we deal with these issues. God loves people, but he hates sin. He is the truth. Every other man is a liar. And this guy's saying, our sin, make, our sin makes God look better. I don't understand why you're punishing me for that. The pride and arrogance in that statement. Verse 8, of course not. If God were not entirely fair, how would we, he be qualified to judge the world? Well, that's a good question. God is just and merciful. He's the one who set up the moral level by which we live. You're watching now immoral people trying to make moral laws. That doesn't work because they're always, they're always tainted by sin and rebellion. You read in Psalm 2, it's a rebellion. It's a, it's a, a conspiracy against Jesus and his anointed. It's a, against the word of God. But he says it can't be. God has to be perfect so that he can judge fairly. Because God is fair and God is just. Verse 7, but someone might still argue, how can God condemn me as a sinner if my dishonesty highlights his truthfulness and brings him more glory? That guy's saying, well, I can, uh, the more I lie, the better he looks truthful. He looks more truthful the more I lie. How, could, how does that work? You see the twisted idea here that somehow my behavior makes God look better. And that's so far outside the truth that it's dangerous. It's dangerous thinking. Tolerance of our life, tolerance of our nation, tolerance of our world as we're moving deeper and deeper into an antichrist spirit, as you read in 1 John. Verse 8 says, some people even slander us by claiming that we say the more we sin, the better it is. This is the best line in the paragraph. Paul says, those who say such things deserve to be condemned. He gets frustrated. He's like, you know what? These people, this is, yeah, anybody talking like this just deserves to be condemned. I, I think Paul had a, had a, a sense of humor here, but I think he's righteously angry at what he's seeing from the church because he's writing a letter to the church in Rome. By the way, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7 tells us that perilous times will be in the day. And you're looking at all of these personality traits, lovers of God, lovers of money, not lo or, uh, lovers of money, lovers of self, not lovers of God, pompous, haughty, arrogant, right? All the, he's talking to the church because Timothy is a pastor of a church. That's in his letter to him, telling him how to run his church. And how much are we seeing that now as churches and pulpits are pulling away from Jesus Christ? See, we're just looking at tolerance and lawlessness. That's all this is. Tolerance and lawlessness. And for a little bit of word study, lawlessness, uh, Merriam-Webster says that lawlessness is defined as not restrained or controlled by the law. All right, that makes sense. That's pretty easy to talk about. But the word lawlessness as it is translated in the Greek is anomia. Anomia is the word lawlessness as we see it in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, when it says lawlessness will abound and the love of many will grow cold. That's the day and the end days that we're living in. Lawlessness abound. Anybody notice any lawlessness going on around us? No. Not at all. <laughs> but here's an interesting point. The word, the Greek word anomia is the word at which we get the English word anomi. A-N-O-M-I-E. Anomi is the and, and this is, here's the definition of anomy. It's social instability resulting from a breakdown of standards and values. And are we living there? Are we living in anomy now? How about personal unrest, alienation, and uncertainty that comes from a lack of purpose or ideals? What happens when you don't have a purpose? When you don't have a direction? What happens when you just accept any old given thing that feels good at the moment? Now we're finding that that's damaging people. Paul is saying, get out of that stuff. This, all this, this is all garbage. Lawlessness and tolerance of sin will destroy the fabric of your nation, of your culture, of your church, if you're not careful. 
Well, in, in verse 9, he says, well then, should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? Good heavens. <laughs> but remember, he's asking questions that he's, that he's trying to, he's, he's kind of predicting are going to be asked of him when he gets there. He, he's trying to head off this idea, which is really smart. He says, okay, so then the Jews are going to ask if they're better than everybody else. Well, no. It says, no, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As the scripture says, and I'm going to stop there for a second. He's setting precedence. He's going to set precedence here. To understand precedence, it's the best the way to understand that is in the court of law. That when something happens, the, a, it ends up in court and a judge makes a decision. That law is written, that decision is written, and then that decision is used to base other decisions that are similar. As they move up the court or they move up into the Supreme Court, you look back and say, well, okay, this is what I have. This is how it's been decided in the past. So I have to have a parameter by which I can answer or, or, or come up with an answer. A judge can't just say, you know what, I'm just going to say whatever I want. It doesn't work that way. You have to look back to the past until, until the Supreme Court stops to look at it and say, yeah, maybe we should change this. This is not. This is not constitutional. We're seeing a lot of that happening right now in the Supreme Court. But things like if I pull a car over and and that car I have an understand, I, I have a belief but no immediate evidence that there's drugs in it. I take the guy out of the car, I put him in handcuffs, I sit him on the curb, and then I search his car without a warrant. Well, I can't do that. <laughs> because the minute I remove him from the car and the car can't move, it's now become a crime scene. It's become a place that I can have time to get a warrant. Well, that's not always how it used to be. So somebody made it up, messed up, went to court, got into a lawsuit, and a judge made a decision. So from here on out, we have to follow the rules and laws that are created. So what Paul is doing is the same thing. Instead of just kind of coming up with his own ideas about what he thinks is right, he's going to set precedence by telling the Jews they're sinners by pointing to the Old Testament, they should already know very clear evidence that the Jews are sinners so that they can't say, well, we're, we're not sinners. <laughs> no, your book says you are. And that's where we see it in picking up in verse 10. Look, look what it says. It says, as the scripture says, no one is, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one. So in, in verse 10, 11, and 12, Paul is talking about the idea that all people are sinners. Not just some people. Not just those people. All people. No one has done good. That's an all statement. And all have turned away. That's an all statement. And if you want to go in and do a word search... The Greek word for all means all. <laughs> so, so here he is saying, you have already made the statement in your Old Testament that all people are sinners. These are three different Psalms that are quoted here. Paul is really good at just rattling off statements and understandings and evidences in the Bible that are all in different places, but, he, but he's, allowed, he's very good at making arguments about what he's saying. So in 10, 11, and 12, he says, nobody's good. Everybody's a sinner. It's a good statement. It's good evidence. You go back in and you see that they were written by Paul or written by David in the Psalms. And those they believed were spiritually written by God. Now, 13 through 18 is a little bit different statement. But he continues talking. He says, their talk is foul, like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery will always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. These are all statements in the Old Testament concerning the sinfulness and wickedness of the Jews. 
So if you had to say, the, no, no, we're the Jews and we're the chosen people, here's a whole bunch of evidence written in the Old Testament that directly claims from Isaiah and the Psalms that the Jews are sinners and that they're wicked people. And just in case you were wondering about this argument here, I'm going to bring all of my receipts because Paul was really good at this because before he became a Christian, he was in the Sanhedrin which means he was well-learned about the Old Testament. He knew the law. He was very specific about the law, and he could use it as a weapon against the arguments of the Sanhedrin here. I think that's why God chose him. That's why Paul was one of the most influential people in the New Testament, because he was built to be this way. He was built to argue. And we see it throughout the book of Acts and throughout all of his epistles as well. Very learned man. So, what, seriously, no one is good. That's what he's saying. Just like we started at the beginning of this, this message, no one is good. Well, verse 19 says, obviously the law applies to those to whom it was given. For its purpose to, is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. Now I looked in, I had to look into the first part of verse 19 there. But it's an easy understanding here. Obviously the, the law applies to those whom, uh, whom the law was given. That's the Jewish people. It's not for the Gentiles. It's not for anybody else. It's for the people whom the law was given. He's making the point that the law doesn't, you guys don't get to walk away from the law. The law is what condemns you as a Jew. By the way, if you go back and look at chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 12, just to kind of nail that home. Chapter 2, verse 12 says, When the Gentiles sin, they will be destroyed, even though they never had God's written law. And the Jews who do have God's law will be judged by that law when they fail to obey it. For merely listening to the law doesn't make us right with God. It is obeying the law that makes us right in his sight. Even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience, and thoughts either... And thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. That's conscience. That's your conscience. And this is the message I proclaim. That the day is coming when God, through Christ Jesus, will be judge everyone's secret life. The whole point of everything here is that Paul is making, as we get down to, to finish out verse 20, is the idea that all people are sinners. No one has ever been able to escape the idea of, of, of sinning against God. Chapter 1, verse 18 told us that in heaven it is set that what is going to happen to people who have rebelled against God is already set. It's already written here. He told us what he's going to do. We don't have to guess. All you have to do is either accept Jesus or don't accept Jesus. Because the point is here. We're not sitting around and going, I wonder what God's going to do. He's telling him. This is love at its best. As he's saying, quit mistaking this because you're going down a rabbit hole and realize that you're in need of a savior. But one more thing before we come to next time. One thing, look at verse 21, just so you see it. It says, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses. That's the, This is the gospel, right? Because we had the law up into the point where Jesus died and was resurrected, and then the, the law didn't count anymore for salvation. You, did, you couldn't, and we'll get into this as we go through the book of Romans. But the gospel is the turning point. Because the blood, the new covenant and the blood of Jesus brings us to salvation by faith, not by trying to figure out how to keep the law. 
But what's missing here is kind of a, a better understanding of why the law was there so that the, when the law is now and why the law doesn't mean anything anymore. So I just want to show you, I want to kind of fill that hole in a little bit. So let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. We're done in Romans. Galatians chapter 3. Here is Paul writing a letter to the Galatia, the church in Galatia. Galatia was a Roman province in Turkey. So it's a Gentile nation. And it's run by Romans. So he's going to use some understanding and some terms that the Romans are going to understand. As he's talking to the Christian church that he started in Galatia. We're going to pick up chapter 3, verse 19. It says, why then was the law given? Well, it was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. That's Jesus. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was the mediator between God and the people. Now, a mediator is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. But God, who is one, did not use a mediator when he gave his promise to Abraham. Now, this is an interesting question in verse 21. Is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promise? No, well, no, there's not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the scripture declares that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Verse 21 is talking about God's law versus God's promise. He gave his law to Moses, the Ten Commandments upon other ones. We read about those through the first five books of the Bible. The promise was given to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Now, the difference is, is that Moses had the law. It had to be kept perfectly. Abraham had the promise of God that the Messiah would come from him, that he would be a great nation, that they would be blessed beyond that, and it said that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. That's faith. So God's promise is faith and God's law is the law, right? God's, and so is, is there a problem here? Is there a problem? Well, no, because the law can't save you. You have to keep the law perfectly. If you can't keep the law perfectly, then you're in rebellion against God. And we know that that's impossible. So the law had a reason for being there, but it wasn't salvation. And we'll see that in verse 23. It says, before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. Now, the interesting using the word guardian, because it makes it sound like we're being lorded over this person, maybe armed, whatever it is, a guardian. But the word is pahidagogos. It's pahidagogos, too many letters, too many syllables, but it's Greek. And it means guardian. It means, it, it, it's the word for guardian. It means tutor. And back in the Roman, and back in the Roman days, if you were of high stature, if you had more money, the men didn't stick around and take care of their kids. They had slaves to do that. So their most trusted slave, they would give him the job of watching after the boys. He would be in charge of the, of protection. He'd be in charge of morality. He'd be in charge of the, of schooling and of education. He would never leave his side until that boy became a man. So take that picture and look at the law that way, that the law keeps you out of trouble. The law keeps you from doing the wrong things. The law tells you when you're doing it wrong. The law gives you a moral feeling that maybe this isn't a good idea. That's what it was supposed to do, but you couldn't keep it. It condemned you. Now, here's, an, here's a way to think about it. You're driving down a country road and there are no speedometer signs. How fast are you going? Now, maybe you're going a uh, 
pretty decent speed. But do you feel bad about it? You don't know what the speed limit is. So how can you be condemned? But the minute you see that sign and it says 25 and you're doing 35, now you're starting to, now you see it, you know that you're wrong and knowing you're wrong tweaks your conscience and you say, okay, I'm driving a little, I'm driving a little fast. And then the blue and red lights show up behind you (laughs) and now you're really condemned and you feel really bad about it and you come up with your reason for doing such. I just... My, my rule was, if you gave me a reason I'd never heard before, I would let you off. <clears throat> I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> Condemnation beyond that, right? So, but that's why the, that's the whole reason why the law is there. The law was just to show you you couldn't do it on your own. And when Jesus came and died and the new covenant came in his blood, we were given over to faith instead of the law because we couldn't keep the law. Verse 26 says, for you are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. That's the argument that the Jewish nation was making. We're sons of Abraham because we were born Jews. And he's saying you're sons of Abraham because you are by faith born again in Jesus Christ. And there's a difference. One is trying to do it by works. The other is trying to do it by faith. And we all know in this, we're well learned in this church what that means. To close, I want to quote Colossians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. It says, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We're talking about God's mysterious plan, the mystery You'll see the word mystery in Ephesians. He's talking about, well, what is that mystery? Well, back in Genesis chapter three, when Abraham, when, when, when God told, when God told Satan that he was going to send the, the seed of the woman, the seed of the virgin to crush his head, that was the start of what was needed. Well, that's the mystery. Nobody knew throughout the whole Old Testament how that was going to be done. But then Jesus was born and Jesus the Messiah came and Jesus died and was resurrected for our behalf. This was God saving humanity from the devil and that is the mystery. But we will make that turn next time. So Father, thank you, Lord, for... This message for the word, for the gathering, Lord, for for everything that you bring us, you are so good to us, Lord. We're grateful, Lord, that the law came in and gave us a, 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 a lattice of understanding so that faith by Jesus Christ was the only option and that we would understand why that was because we're grateful, Lord, that you died for us, that you shed your blood for us, that we have been saved through faith and born again. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would go amongst us, go before us, straighten our paths, and bring our mountains down. Father, be our rear guard, and uh, and love us, and, and take care of us for seen and unseen dangers this week. Father, we're grateful for your grace. We pray all of this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.